start off by saying, show of hands, who went fishing today? <laughs> oh, there's another one. Yep, two of us did. Nice, Frostbiter's rule. Uh, what did you catch? <laughs> what did you catch? We thought we caught was cold. <laughs> yeah, it was very cold out there today, but we were doing it February 12th. Out in the lake, so um, we got a lot of great speakers. So I'd like to like to get to that, and hope you enjoy this. And then afterwards, we'll uh, have some prizes and have some fun. I'm going to hand you over to Bill, who's going to do some introductions, and then we'll have some fun. Thank you, Dean. Welcome, guys. It's good to see such a good crowd on a cold Friday afternoon. Um, first off. I'm going to introduce Tom Manley from the Geology Department at Middlebury College. And Tom was instrumental, and Tom and his wife Pat, in getting the research vessel David Folger built and constructed. Um, and I'll let you listen to what Tom has to say. The boat is on the lake, and if it's not familiar to you folks, it will be after this. Tom? Okay, so, can everybody hear me back there? Is that so? All right. So, uh, before I actually talk about the RV Folger, what Bill refers to as this hunk of aluminum out in Lake Champlain, I'm going to take you back in time, back to 1989, when my wife Patricia and I first showed up at Middlebury College and inherited our first research vessel as part of the Lake Studies program. And that was it. A 30-foot, 30 32-foot racing lobster boat. The first time I used this guy, I used the davit that you see right here, and I bent it in half. So that gave me a good clue as to what was going to be going on in the future with this boat. It took us about two years of finally getting enough money and, and refurbishing the boat until finally it ended up as a U.S. Coast Guard designated oceanographic research vessel. At that point in time, we used it for approximately 20 years, but we knew we had limitations with it. We had tremendous research capabilities, we had tremendous students, but we had limitations. And it was also getting old. And so we actually proposed in 2009, and believe it or not, actually was granted National Science Foundation funding to actually replace this vessel with the 48-foot aluminum catamaran called the RV Folger. Okay? It's a U.S. inspected, U.S. Coast Guard inspected vessel, maximum of 18 people with two crew. And this is one of our planning sessions, and this, this beautiful lady that you see right over here is my wife Patricia. She was part of that that crew that helped develop it. And of course, you probably may know this guy right over here, Mr. Richard Furbish. So he's sitting back there somewhere. Okay. But anyways, uh, after the planning session was done, we started laying the keel, as you can see here. And this was built in Bellingham, Washington, the state of Washington. So we built the keel, then the superstructure, wheelhouse lab area was constructed. We received our two Yanmar 370 horsepower diesel engines. We got an 18 kilowatt generator, okay, and it was actually installed right in here. Supplies all of our power for the ship as well as all the hydraulics for the ship too. And you can see it's a tight compartment. There's the Yanmar sitting right in through here. So you have to be pretty adept at crawling around on your belly in order to get into that thing. Then, of course, we have the absolute nightmare of wiring. Not only ship's wiring, but we also had a huge amount of miles of science gear wiring. Before you know it, it was done. In September 9, 2012, it actually showed up on Lake Champlain, and that was a nightmare for me because I only had three days before classes started. So trying to get everything working was pretty impressive. Nevertheless, we'll show you what's inside the vessel. We're standing in the lab right now. We're actually going to look towards the wheelhouse. And you notice that there's some words written up there. Captain side, student side. Okay, so this is an educational research vessel. So we teach students a lot about the operations of the vessel. 
So we'll take a quick hike up there into the wheelhouse. And there you have a student on the right-hand side, uh, Dick Furbish on the left-hand side doing his captain thing. And some basic things is that strictly Furuno Navionics on the boat. We have an autopilot that we, once we set a track line in motion, can keep us on track plus or minus six feet. Eight remote cameras. Any one of them can be displayed on this monitor right in through here. We have remote displays right over here that actually give us instrument information on some of the other instruments that we have up on the mast. The RV Folger has its own local internet as well as a full wireless system. We have three HVACs on the boat. One for the wheelhouse, one for the lab, and one to control the heat on the computers. We have an integrated iPad, which is just located right over here, which actually keeps us up to date with very broad ranging weather, high resolution radar, as well as the newest bond the bathymetry map of Lake Champlain, which we'll talk about later. It's strictly LED lit, and we have smart classroom technology. Smart classroom technology means that any one of the seven computer monitors that we have on board can actually be ported to any, any, any one or any two of the large screen monitors that we have. So we're going to step back a little bit. If you go down to the starboard pontoon, you have your bunk room, port side pontoon, we have the galley, and the boat doesn't leave until this pot is full. That's Richard's commandeering, you yeah, know, it's got to happen, you know, it just doesn't function well without coffee. Okay? If you spin 180 degrees around and look at the lab structure itself, you'll see right in here, here's one of our large screen monitors. We have two, they're back to back. One faces towards the aft deck, one faces toward the inside of the lab. This one actually is on a slide rail system, so it can actually be brought forward or put out of the way. We have our chemistry station right in through here. It's a special countertop to resist uh, light acids. In the head, we also have a shower and an eye wash station in case anybody gets into problems with the acid. We made it absolutely clear to the boat builder we wanted as much cabin, uh, cabinet and storage space as possible, so we loaded the entire area up as much as possible. Okay? This is an example of that large screen monitor coming out on its track so it's easy viewable. And then if you look at the science control stations, okay, we have a port side, starboard side, they look almost identical, and each section controls different parts of the science program. One thing to point out is that each side has its own computer system, okay, so we have three feet of computer rack here, three feet of computer rack over there. Behind each computer rack is the HVAC system, okay, shown in green here. So in that area is the HVAC system for either the lab or the uh, computer rack. These are the instruments or the science gear that these computers actually control. We can't talk about all of them today, however, we will only talk about the ones that are written in white here. So only those are the ones that we're going to be focusing on. If you go to the aft deck, pretty roomy when you get back there. Richard's giving uh, a little intro course on how to run an ROV on the back deck. If you still are on the back deck and look around, we have an app knuckle boom crane, we have an A-frame, pull master winch, pressure washer, swim platforms and ladders, and a large volume washdown hose. This is the second large screen monitor that faces aft, so anybody can see what's going on. And then if you step back a little bit on the aft deck and look up to the old one deck, you see our two main winches. We have our master here, which is 1,500 feet of quarter inch wire rope. And then over here we have our electrically conducting cable on the CCD winch. Above that we have our reclining mast that actually folds down in case we need to get through a bridge area. And then we also have other sensors like meteorology, 
and incoming solar radiation. If you go up to the O1 deck, this is the control central area. You have a clear view of what's going on on the main deck. And this right in here is the master control. We have all of our controls to control the, both winches, the A-frame, the pull master winch. We have our knuckle boom crane winches controlled over on this panel over here. If for some reason we need to monitor the amount of cable put out, you know, then we have a wireless meter wheel, which is this guy right in here, that transmits its data to this particular instrument, keeps track of it. And this guy, this one right in here, then sends all of that information to all seven computers in the lab space. We also have aft helm controls, so we can control the ship that way. If you spin 180 degrees around and face forward, you'll have the forward helm controls located there. Next to that, we have two 10-person life rafts. And one of our design characteristics was we wanted to have speed. We needed to get places fast, do our research, get back. And so we run around 26 knots, maximum speed. If you look at this upper right-hand image right <laughs> through here, that's the Folger running at maximum speed. You'll notice it's not a standard displacement hole. We call it a semi-displacement. And the reason is that there is a huge hydrofoil built between both pontoons that actually lifts it out of the water a little bit get a little bit more speed and a better fuel economy. What's the, what's the purpose of the Folger? Well, I think I already alluded to it. It is education. Research is a bad second. Okay? If there's any conflict as to who takes ownership of that vessel, it is education first. Research will always come second. This is a typical class that you might see, 10 to 12 students out there. But we draw from oceanography, marine geology, biology, chemistry, environmental studies, senior thesis programs, et cetera, et cetera, summer programs. So you'll see a lot of us out there just doing education. And then after that, then it's research. Okay? So we've seen the boat. Now we're going to talk about some of the science here. And I'm going to break it up into two major components. Those pieces that are towed behind the vessel and those pieces that are not towed behind the vessel. So I'm going to talk about non-towed right off the bat. Our remotely operated vehicle, again, one of our mantras for education is that every student gets hands on deck. Everybody gets wet, dirty, slimy, and grimy. Okay? That's the only way that we feel that they really learn how to actually operate themselves on a research vessel. So there's an example again of that large screen monitor displaying whatever is going on on the ROV. And believe me, one of the biggest hits is trying to actually learn how to control that. Every student learns how to drive that, that ROV for at least five or ten minutes, and it's, it's pretty tough, even for the younger generation. But believe me, if someone can actually grab a stick on the bottom of the lake, that's the cat's meow. They have got it made. They've got, you know, kudos all over the place. So there's a lot of hurrahs. And you're probably going to ask me, did you see any fish? Yeah. <laughs> I saw, we saw lots of them, okay? Then the other one is where we are not uh, towing anything is when we are actually adrift. These are hydrographic stations, subsurface moorings. And here is our CTD and rosette system. The rosette system is nothing more than a bunch of bottles, okay? Niska bottles that can trap water at any time we want during the profile as it goes down into the water column. Did I lose something? No. The CTD is what you see right in here in its full form up in the upper right hand side. It stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. And there's a myriad of other sensors that we have on this system that I don't think I'm going to worry about talking about, but they, they are automatically recording three times per second as it lowers itself and brings itself back up into the water column. It is electronically conducting cable, so everything is ported back up to our computer system. So you can see exactly everything that's going on on one of the monitors that controls this system as it goes down and comes back up. Anytime we want to take a water sample because we found something very, very unique, all we have to do is push a button 
and it happens. The next thing is that if you wanted to actually monitor a particular site in the lake for a long period of time, sure, you could pull this operation you know, for six months, 24-7, but I don't think a lot of people would like to do it. So what we end up doing is putting out these pieces of hardware we call subsurface moorings, which are fairly simple in design. It comprises itself of an anchor, very heavy anchor, maybe seven, eight hundred pounds at the bottom, quarter inch wire rope that goes up to the top, and then there's a flotation sphere up there. That flotation sphere is well below ship traffic interference. We have to maintain that for the U.S. Coast Guard and just for our own sanity also. So the minimum depth that that float will actually be is 12 feet. Most of the time it's on the order of 20 feet, so it's completely out of anybody's interference area. In this particular diagram here, you're looking at a mooring setup with 11 temperature sensors and an ADCP. The ADCP is nothing more than a fancy instrument that actually records water velocity throughout the entire water column over time. So all of these sensors here are collecting data every half hour. Okay. Here's a typical mooring deployment. We have five subsurface moorings that are going to be deployed. This is on the Melosira. Here are flotation <coughs> spheres. Here are sets of anchors right in through here. Here is the ADCP. And this right in here is the coil of 11 temperature sensors that we attach to that line. So I'm going to take you to two spots. This is 1991 data. Okay. I'm going to take you to two spots. One at Valcor Island, one at Thompson's Point, and I'm going to show you the results of the thermal temperature sensors at that particular time. Okay? They will look like this. So therefore, is, is this thing actually doing anything? Yeah. Yes. It is? Okay. All right. I'll, I'll stick it in my face. Oh, okay. So, uh, if you look at the panels, okay, they are temperature, warmer colors, Warmer, you know, hotter temperatures, okay? So we have our color key down here, 30 degrees centigrade being red, zero degrees being purple right in here, depth being your vertical axis down to 60 meters, which is pretty, pretty close to around 200 feet, and time goes on the horizontal axis with tick marks every 10 days, okay? So there's a lot of variation that you're seeing here. There are three components to each one of these panels. One is that you have this warm stuff sitting at the top, which is the mixed layer, okay, often referred to as the epilimnion. You have this cold leftover winter water from the previous year, the hypolimnion. And then you have this bluish to green area right in through here, which we define as our thermocline, the boundary between the upper and lower waters. Now, I know most everybody tends to be very fixated on where this thermocline is. But you, because you start looking at this, you're going to start seeing some patterns. One is we start seeing oscillations of this thermocline. It goes up and down, sometimes not very much, like right in here, and sometimes really big oscillations. When you have a system that oscillates, we often refer to it as a wave. And once you define it as a wave, you have certain things that you can define about it. Wave period, wave height, wave length. So if I actually wanted to define the wave period of these particular waves, I'm going to put two white lines up here, which define you know, two successive crests or two successive troughs. Doesn't make any difference. So I'm just going to say up in here at Balfour, I've got two crests of the thermocline up there. Distance between those lines is about five days. Okay? And the other thing I want to point out is that these oscillations at Valcor are 180 degrees out of phase with Thompson's point. So therefore, if I look at this first line here, I see that Thompson's point, the thermocline is down 40, 50 meters. It's deep. If I go up at Valcor Island at the same time, thermocline is almost at the surface, maybe seven, eight meters down. And this is occurring all the time. There's this constant oscillation that's going on in the lake. So if you were fishing at any one of these spots, it would not be uncommon that in a matter of two or three days, you would see the thermocline rise or fall on the order of 
30 meters or 100 feet. So, things to talk away, take away with. Oscillations, about four to five days, pretty standard. Now I'm going to take you over and we're going to look at Valcor only. Valcor only water velocity measurements from the same instrument. You're going to have, it's going to be right in through here, like that, right there. And the panels are going to look fairly similar <coughs> as far as color, but they mean something totally different. Colors now mean water velocity. So, if I look at this bottom scale here, <coughs> if I am in the reds, yellows, and oranges, that means I'm in positive velocity, which means it's either north or eastward moving. If I'm in the blues and purples, then that means I am in the negative velocities, or southward or westward moving, depending on which panel I'm at. I've got a north-south panel here, an east-west panel here. So I've, I've taken speed and direction, <coughs> broken it up into two perpendicular components. And the other thing, oh, and as far as maximum magnitude, at the end of these, purple and red is about one knot. <coughs> So, if you look at these two panels, and you look at where is the maximum speed, it's going to be in the north-south panel, okay? There's very little action going on in the east-west panel. Most of it's actually here, where you see all these bright colors. And the reason is pretty obvious. The channel alignment of this particular region is north-south, so therefore you'd expect that. So, I'm going to place on here just some simple letters south and north. So if you're in blue, you're southward moving currents. If you're in yellows and reds, there's a north current. Notice what's going to happen is it's going to oscillate. Okay, so the first thing is you have opposed current going like this, top and bottom. And then they go this way, and then after a period of time, everything reverses and they go that way. And then after a period of time, they go that way again. So bi-directional flow oscillating back and forth. So that's why you have this flipping motion going on. So how is this coupled with that temperature data? So these red lines here, okay, I'm going to just sort of like blank out east-west because that's really not a concern to us. We're going to focus up here. So these red lines represent the thermocline. And you'll notice that there is a pattern evolved here. If the thermocline rises, then you have this structure in velocity. If you have a thermocline that's dropping, you have that structure of the velocity field. So it's a very, very simplistic system. Both of these guys are coupled together. When one happens, the other is follow suit. How does this actually get put together? Well, I'm going to take a cross section through beautiful Lake Champlain. Okay? I'm going to go from north to south, Rouse's Point, all the way down to the Crown Point Bridge. And I'm going to say that this thermocline system operates within that zone. So this black line right in here represents your thermocline that's going to oscillate on the period of four or five days. Above it, you have your warm water. Below it, you have your cold water. In the middle is the latitude of Burlington. So therefore, I want you to <coughs> sort of like, look, I've created little velocity vectors in here. So I want you to see what's going on with velocity as the thermocline oscillates up and down over the Lake Champlain region. Wasn't that simple? <laughs> That's how it's all linked together. This particular wave is enormously long. Lake Champlain from Rouse's Point to Crown Point Bridge is about 100 kilometers long. You're looking at only half the wavelength of this wave. You know, to go full wavelength, you have to go crest to crest or trough to trough. We only are going trough to crest, half the wavelength. So the wavelength of this wave is 200 kilometers. Also notice that 
The thermocline does not oscillate or change elevation at its pivot point. Only far away from its pivot point do you start seeing these changes in thermocline structure. So therefore, if you're at Burlington, chances are, or the latitude there about Burlington, it's not going to be so bad. You go up to Valcor or Thompson's Point, then you're going to start seeing these large oscillations. Does this oscillatory field always happen? The answer is, whoops, wrong button. Yep, sure does. So long as the net result here is, so long as there is stratification in this lake, during early spring, summer, late fall, possibly early winter, if there is any stratification in this lake, that internal standing wave, which we just described, will always be present. So therefore, do you see the internal standing wave ever stop and go to a quiescent field? Nowhere, no way. Constantly oscillating, year one, year two, year three. This is all Thompson's point data. It doesn't stop. It's continually in motion. Now, we learned a tremendous amount of information from these subsurface moorings. This is just gorgeous data. We learned a tremendous amount. But they have a problem with them. If I had this stick right in here, and it represented my mooring, okay, then number one is I would be able to actually monitor Oops, okay, hope it didn't break that. I could actually monitor what the thermal structure was, as well as the velocity field, in close proximity where that mooring was. But if I was trying to map a water parcel that came into contact with the mooring, I know what its characteristics were, speed and direction and temperature, but after it left the mooring, I have no clue where it went. So therefore, moorings are good for certain things, but if I want to track water, I have to go to a different philosophy. And that's what we're going to go to next. These are what we call drifters and floats. Okay, so vessel status is now changing here. When we deploy our drifters, we're usually underway. When we recover them, we are usually at a drift state, which we snuggle up to them, bring them on board. The drifter is a very, very simple thing to deal with. It is a enclosed PVC tube, watertight. You attach a small anchor at the bottom of it, as Mika is doing right in through here. And there's the anchor right in through there. And then Matt is actually installing a handheld GPS tracking device at the top of the unit. Okay, And that's located right in through here. So you basically throw, our students throw roughly eight to ten of these off during their class period, usually in a line, and they track them. Because we're operating classes, we don't have an infinite amount of time on these drifters. So they're usually, we get a drift track that's by hour, hour and a half long, and that's about it for the day. However, if you go ahead and accumulate this information over a decade, here's the results at Thompson's Point. So this is only for drift tracks that occurred under a northerly wind. Okay, it could be northeast, northwest, or northerly. It doesn't make any difference. You're seeing a pattern here that's fairly consistent. If I drew a bunch of arrows on there, that's the basic gross pattern of what that system is doing under a north wind. If I did the same thing for a south wind environment, you know, structure changes a little bit, but it's pretty much what you'd expect. I'll put some arrows on there. I think the only thing that's really worth noting is that we actually, actually see some kind of a counterclockwise gyre being developed in Town Farm Bay. Now, this past year, we actually pulled a game on our classes, and we got four and a half to six hours on these guys. And so these black marks here are the previous archive data. This is the 2015 data. And you can see some of them just sort of like come to a screeching halt and take off going a different direction. Okay? Without belaboring the point, what we believe is that this is actually a basically a boundary current on the eastern shoreline. Okay? That's been 
developed because there was a complete relaxation in the wind. It was strong from the north, and after a while, it just started peter out and starting to reverse. And so this allowed a buildup of water in the south part of the lake to fire up and move along the eastern side. This guy right in here, you can see all these drift tracks come up, and then they take a hike left to the west, and they go shooting up north. This, again, is part of that what we believe. This is under a southwest wind, and we believe that we actually build up a lot of water in this particular area. Okay, goes around and out as a high-speed current, which knocks those drifters off to the west. Now, those drifters we just talked about, you have to tend them. You have to be nurturing them. You have to watch them. You're always in close contact with them. But if you could imagine having an autonomous system that you could actually pre-program to a specific depth that you want to monitor, you throw it into the lake, and it goes down and acts as a passive drifter. Whatever the currents are doing, it goes with it. And then it also simultaneously maps itself, its trajectory underwater, comes up to the surface periodically, telemeters its data to satellite. I get it in my office and I can see what it's doing. I can then write a program and tell it, I want you to do something different, and it will go back down to a different depth or whatever. So it took us about seven years to develop this, but we have some unbelievable results obtained by this passive drifter tracking system. And I'm not going to go into all of it. Bill wanted me to talk about one thing and one thing only. We call it the superhighway. So this is us going out and retrieving these drifters. They're usually employed for anywhere from like seven days to two weeks. And so we're out there. You know, they pop up, we get a radio signal as to where they are, plus or minus a kilometer. We go out there, pick them up, life is good. And then we got a radio report, one of the units popped up. We were out in the central body of uh, Lake Champlain, around latitude of Burlington, because that's where we picked up all of them. You know, all the surface ones we deployed, all the deep ones, they all were within like five, six, seven kilometers where we dumped them off. And they did this exactly what we'd expect. This internal standing wave, slosh north, slosh south, slosh north. They don't go anywhere. They just slosh around a lot. Well, we, we looked at this one, the latitude and longitude of where it popped up, and we just looked at each other. Richard was on the Melissa. We just said, this can't be right. We got a second uh, position off it a half an hour later, and sure enough, it was almost near the Crown Point Bridge. Way down there. So it was up here when we deployed it. It took a hard western turn, and somehow these dash lines means we don't know exactly how it got there, but it got there. Ended up way down past Northwest Bay area. That's where we picked it up. That's what we couldn't believe. So what I have here is two of those subsurface drifters, one of that were deployed simultaneously at 22 meters and 24 meters, only six feet apart. And they were deployed right here. <coughs> and you're going to see a one-month trajectory path. The first thing that you're going to see is that they track each other. They're just going to keep going north, just hightailing it up here. And then all of a sudden, they are going to split and diverge and go in opposite directions. In only six feet of difference, one is going following a current that's going that way, and the other one's going the opposite direction. And then what's going to happen, we're, that uh, guy is just going to take off, but we're going to stay with this guy, and he's going to show you this high speed jet along the western boundary of Lake Champlain. So I have to set this guy up so it'll play. Okay, so they start, you can see. The drift tracks going up here, they, this is wind vectors here. They, come, they congregate and then they split. One goes north, one goes here. This is the one you want to follow. Okay? So it's going to hug the western coast, almost jump into Willsboro Bay, go visit the Four Brothers, and then watch it rip down all the way past Northwest Bay. That is what we call the superhighway. It exists only at a boundary 
very, very thin layer at the base of the mixed layer and the very, very top of the thermoclay. That's the only place where that circulation structure exists. Very, very unique. We're still investigating it. Next one, towed vehicles. What we tow behind us. Side scan sonar. Used by many people, used by the state police to find people that have been drowning or whatever like that. For our purpose, we look at geology, shipwrecks, environmental kind of stuff. It's a swath mapping tool. And by swath mapping, oh, I should also say right at the very top, we can tow this vest, this vehicle, we call it the fish, behind the boat up to a thousand feet behind us. So it's important that we just monitor it very, very well. Typical mapping speeds are four to six knots, and we follow usually very, very dedicated track lines. This is the what we call the fish, that's the side scan sonar. In order to have it actually operate <coughs> optimally, it has to be set at 10 meters above the bottom. And at that point in time, you get your best viewing angles of all the objects down there. And we also get 100 meters on either side of the vessel being mapped. That's what we call swath mapping. Here's an example of the side scan sonar record. The white line represents the track of the fish. Black area represents water, okay? It's seeing nothing during its, the transit, seeing in here, and all of a sudden it hits seafloor. And if you look at this image very carefully, you will find a shipwreck and a mast that's lying across it. Okay, here's the outline of the shipwreck right here, and there's the mast, okay? Seen on both port and starboard sides, okay? So when we do our tracking, okay, actually mowing the lawn, we will set up a, drift tra uh, a ship track going north, one going south, and making sure that there is an overlap between those so we don't miss anything. There's an example of some track lines. Now, if you just sort of like exaggerate this and say, we're going to map the entire bottom of Lake Champlain doing this, sure, we could do it. It took us only seven years to do this. <laughs> it was a project between Middlebury College and the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Lake Champlain Maritime Museum wanted to basically document every shipwreck or artifact that was on the bottom of this lake. We were interested more in the geology and dynamics of that area, and there were two major vessels being used, the RV Neptune with Freddy Fayette and the RV Baldwin, and you can see now how much time we spent going up and down this, this lake mowing the lawn. Okay. All totaled, we found over 2,000 artifacts, or tar what we call contacts, 356 were shipwrecks, 374 we still have to go back to and investigate. They are high ticket, high priority items. These guys are side scan records of what it looks like to actually be out there and see things like this. This is the Horse Ferry, which is a dive site that's out of uh, Burlington Harbor. This is an airplane on side scan imagery. This is what it looks like on land. <coughs> And that is an old canal boat over there. So, let me digress just a little bit. Standard NOAA map. I don't know how many people have realized that these discrete observations were made mid to late 1800s. There are a total of 10,000 of them, and they were based on lead line observations. Okay? When we take our data, remember all those lines we did up and down Lake Champlain? Every few seconds we captured bottom bathymetry off of our PDRs. Three, almost three quarters of a million observations. Marry those guys up and you end up with a lot of work and a brand new bottom bathymetry map, 2005 edition. The other instrument that we tow is the chirp. It is a sub-bottom profiling system. That's what it looks like. The only difference between it and your single beam echo finder or echo sounder is that we have more power. So therefore, we have the ability to send sound signals into the sediment so all these layers get reflected back 
And here's an example of a chirp record. Here's the water, nice and white, it's clear. And then you'll also notice we have four major structures that you can see here. Basement rock, this large fuzzy zone right in through here above the basement rock. This is when this particular area, 12 to 13,000 years ago, was a pro-glacial lake. So as the glaciers were receding north into Canada, there was a lake right in front of it. Then, as that lake actually, as the glaciers broached the St. Lawrence Seaway, all the water was lost into the North Atlantic. And believe it or not, the North Atlantic came into this basin. Lake Champlain became an estuary of the North Atlantic okay, during 10 to 12,000 years ago. And then at about 10,000 years ago, that stopped. And for the last 10,000 years, we've been accumulating or looking like Lake Champlain as it is today. So that's what a chirp record looks like. If you, I know a lot of people look for shoals. This is what a shoal looks like in chirp land. Okay? You can see the basement rock outcropping, and then finally, there's your shoal. We take a lot of these, and we're still accumulate them. We have about 800 of these chirp records. And the next one we want to talk about is the most sophisticated tool that we have, what we call multi-beam, high-resolution bottom mapping. Again, compare it to your standard single-beam echo sounder, except Uberize it by 512 beams. Okay? So there are 512 beams, each designed to map a swath area and designed specifically for bottom bath imagery. And this image that you see right here is real, okay? When you actually are mapping the bottom of the lake with multi-beam, you actually see the bottom painted out for you, real time, all connected. So pass after pass of mowing the lawn over, you just end up with an accumulation of data that actually shows everywhere you've been. This is a 7125 system. It's side mounted on the vessel. This upper part right in here is a sound projector. This lower rectangular brick is the receiver system. It's actually on a pivot, so it's on like this. We just unlock it, swing it down vertically, lock it in place. It's in water, and we start driving. Okay? We start accumulating data. This, the processing of that multi-beam data is intense. It takes a lot of CPU power, but we have two computers devoted to that. Okay? And you can see the map right out here around Diamond Island that was being mapped at the time. The whole system, like I said, is being mapped real time. So the first, pe uh, first question that people ask me, what's the difference between the 2005 data, you know, the map that I just showed you, which was a compendium of all of the side scan data, and the multi-beam data? So we're at the, I picked a spot around the Boquette River area. There's our old 2005, let's say our new 2005 data, and here is the multi-beam data. I think most of you could probably say, wow, look at the difference, okay? Two meter by two meter pixel resolution. Believe me, I can go finer to one meter by one meter, but I just had some two meters sticking around. So look at the detail. It's very, very obvious. Okay. Let's look at some things that we also find, positional errors. I'm going to take you to this little spot right in here. We have a shoal in Town Farm Bay. It says it's circular. In actuality, when we mapped that area, we found out that it was not circular. It's more oblate. And it is not at where they say it is. Okay. Well, maybe that's not new for some of you guys, but okay. We thought it was rather fun. And then when you look at it in detail, okay, you find out you have huge structural dynamics that we never could get before. And if you look at these little lines right in here, those are anchor drags. So we'll be able to see very, very fine detail in very shallow water. Now, just imagine, here is a sailing canal boat. It's being scuttled in the lake. When it leaves the water surface, it's Bow down attitude. It's going down bow first. It's developing momentum. By the time it hits the bottom, it either buries itself in the bottom, or in this particular case, 
The bottom is not flat, it's sloped. So it hits the bottom and basically glides all the way down, leaving a snake trail behind it until it comes to its final resting place in the deep part of the lake. So I want you to imagine that and then look at this. Shipwreck. You see this squiggly line here? Okay. That is where it hit the bottom. And this is the gouge mark it left until it finally got to its resting place. This right over here with our software, we can actually look at all sorts of details. But the slide path was 400, four football fields. It went down. And the angle of attack, you know, the angle of this slope here is anywhere from 3 to 11 degrees. I could pick it out in more detail, but I thought it was interesting. Then, we also have the ability to not only map the bottom as a surface, but we also have the ability to actually look at the actual individual 512 points all accumulated. And so we call this a point cloud. And so you're looking at all those 512 points that are mapping the water witch, which is south of Diamond Island in the Town Farm Bay area. So having this ability allows us to look in the great detail on the structural dynamics of that particular ship. Okay. What do you think? Welcome to submarine landslide area. Okay. This was something that rather shocked us, to tell you the truth. A submarine landslide. Okay. Looks something like this. Okay, if it's on land, you probably have seen hundreds of these guys through your lifetime. Okay, I just I just took a snapshot of this off of Route 7 just about four days ago. Okay. It is basically a mass wasting event. The stream undercut the sediment. There was no support there, so the sediment just fell down, left a huge, you know, sort of like scar there. Okay? And then we have sort of like the same thing over here. It's all the same thing. Huge cut, a lot of debris sitting on the bottom. We call this a debris fan. Okay? Whatever comes off of this source region right in here is deposited into the lake. And I had to come up with a metric, so I call it 1BB, okay? A foot, a meter, doesn't work, so I came up with 1BB, something a little bit bigger, okay? It's Bill's 22-foot boat, okay? That's why it's the BB. One Bill boat, okay? So, not that I would like to see it stuck in that ravine, but that's about how big the ravine is, okay? It's about 22 feet long, okay? So, I'm going to take... 1 BB as far as a length measurement and put it onto this debris fan. Okay? We're going to go there, sink it. I don't want to sink your boat. We'll just, it's a visual thing. Okay? There's 1 BB, 1 billboat. So I came up with a new metric, which I thought was going to be the perfect fishing boat. You ready for it? I call it the AC. Because we're going to use it in units of 1 AC. The aircraft carrier. Okay, so we're going to take the aircraft carrier and throw it in there and see how many of those fill up. One and three quarters aircraft carriers fill up the width of that debris fan. Where is it located? Right off to the west of the Four Brothers. The largest landslide that we have seen so far exists west of Shelburne Point area. In this area right through here. Okay? So you'll actually see several other landslides in this area, but the one that is the biggest one is this guy. We have our source region, we have our debris fan, and I've outlined it up there as a, sort of like a visual orientation. When you look at it at a different angle, you see some very unique things about it. So we actually mapped it out, got some statistics on it, and said, okay, if we look at the debris fan itself, it's about 1,500 meters wide. That's a lot. Okay? Surface area of about two square kilometers. Okay? If we actually look at the chirp, which I showed you earlier, then we get to see both this debris fan and that one right next to each other. See? Here's the main debris fan, there's the one off debris fan 2 right in through here, and you can see how they're overlapped. 
right here. There's one, the purple one is sitting on top of the orange one. There it is. <coughs> when it flowed out, it actually overrode the debris fan coming from the western side of the lake. Volume. I can hand out some weird numbers, but I'm going to try to make it real. And in honor of Super Bowl weekend, I'm going to use the football field as my linear measurement. Okay? It's roughly 100 meters long. So I'm going to create the one CFF, one cubic football field. Football field on either side of the cube, and it takes six cubic football fields to fill up the source region. Now when you start thinking about that, there's a real problem here. When you take this much material from that zone there, and allow it to slide down to this zone over here and do it in a very short time, there's going to be a response. I think you're probably thinking the same thing I am. Tsunami. Okay. There have been numerous reports of lake tsunamis in the historical record. Okay. I actually borrowed the Cornell University Open Ocean Tsunami Model brought it in to operate on Lake Champlain. So I wanted to see, if is this really something to be concerned about, or is this sort of like Nambi Pambi stuff, we don't have to worry about it at all. So, we found three large landslides that we believe were, were basically dumped in Lake Champlain simultaneously. Okay? So I took those three. The big one that you saw, the one next to it, and there was one over at Four Brothers. Okay? I took those three landslides, modeled them in the lake, and so this is the main model right in through here. And then I have sub-models that are actually going to look at higher resolution around Burlington, Shelburne Bay. That's what's highlighted right here. You can see a model over there and then one around the Quaker Smith Meach Coach area right over through here. So what you're going to see is, right now it's a neutral surface, and then when those earthquakes let go, then the surface is going to respond. Okay? Initially it's going to be a down warping of <coughs> the surface, okay? because you're releasing all that material and it's going down, so that surface is going to fall it. I don't know how many people realize, but steel, and water have the same compressibility. So it's like holding a steel rod, something goes, you know, uh, gives out below the steel rod, and steel rod's going to drop. Same thing for water, okay? It's going to drop too. So here is our scale. In this particular model, the lake can go as high as 13 feet plus, and can go as low as 13 feet plus. If you're interested in time, how fast things are going to get to the shoreline, this is our time clock right in here. The model will be run twice, okay? So you can just look at it initially and then suck it up the second time. Get a good handle on it. Okay, so let me uh, fire it up here. Okay, here we go. There is the initial impact, and then the wave spreads out and impacts the rest of the shoreline. And you'll notice when it hits the shoreline, you're in the yellows and greens, okay? So when it hits the shoreline, even though it might be 13 feet high, 13 feet low at the slide area, by the time you actually get to the shoreline, it's about plus or minus one meter. And so it'll actually replay itself. This is 12 minutes when I stop it. So there's not what you call a lot of time before all this actually happens. And this is a result of an earthquake? Question is, is this the result of an earthquake? All of our data presently suggests that an earthquake actually was the forcing function. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the there was another investigator up in Canada that looked at landslides on land. 
and he came up with three different time epochs, okay, where landslides were actually very prevalent. He dated them, okay, so he knows exactly when these systems occurred. The ones that we sound, found here, we dated those as best we could, and we found out that it agreed with one of his pillars of earthquake activity. Timing, 5,000 years ago. Okay? That's when these guys actually happened. Okay? Wow. So, before I go too far down the road, I just if you actually see this big hunk of aluminum out in the water <laughs> doing something that's not high speed, and you actually see these day shapes here, uh, it would be really great if you could help us out and give us a lot of leeway, okay? These are restricted maneuverability day shapes. If at night you have red, white, red, that's what you see on the lights. But in general, when we're towing stuff and we're running dedicated lines, you know, we just give us some free play. That would be help us a lot because if we vary off of those lines, that means we have to circle around and we have to redo the mapping again. Okay, so it's just one of those things. You will actually see the Melosyra use those day shapes when they uh, do trawling rigs or chirp or things like that. I'm not quite sure about the SUNY Plattsburgh RV grundling, but uh, the thing is that they, we do fly them, and it's just sort of like make sure that, you know, you sort of like under, understand what those guys are. And the last thing that Bill wanted me to talk about was this guy. We lost, well, we're going to try to recover. We lost this guy. It is a piston core. One way to actually take sediment samples, okay, from the lake is to actually, you know, basically take a tube of plastic encased in steel and just ram it into the sediment and you'll end up with a two or three foot core. We call it a core. And we come back and then analyze it. When we want to get serious, we use this guy. This is our 12 foot core. Okay? And unfortunately, the inch and a half cable parted and we lost it. It's, it's still down at the bottom of the lake. So Richard put out a basic, oh, here's, here's what the upper part of the core system looks the fins, there's the weights, this is not part of it. Okay. And Richard put out an initial warning saying, okay, if you're in this particular site, which is McDonough Point, Kingsland's Bay is right in through here, McDonough Point's here, then this is where we lost it, and he gave a latitude and longitude as to where it is. We have no clue as to what orientation that piston core is in. It could be standing straight up and down, it could be lying on its side, or anything in between. If you want to look at it in multi-beam land, okay, here is this shoal coming off of McDonough's point right in through here. This is the shoal, okay, and this little point right there is where we lost it. Hopefully we'll be recovering it in June when we can uh, get a diver out there and search for it. But we have a pretty good latitude and longitude on it. And if you see the RV Folger at dock, drop by. We have a standing invite to actually you know, come in and see what we're actually doing. So with that, I think that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> down in that area and you do see the Folger underway. Um, how's that? We on? There it is. There we go. So I was just going to add to uh, what Tom said. If uh, we're out there trolling around and you see the Folger going very slowly, there's a good chance they have gear extended. So just give them a wide berth and uh, everything should be clear. Uh, next up for the guest speakers, uh, two game wardens from Vermont State Fish and Wildlife. Um, we're apt to see them on the water, uh, Burlington, Charlotte, and I'd like to introduce Dana Joyle and Bob Courier, and they're going to come up and give a talk and question and answer period to follow. So. <coughs> I think. Best. It's sort of like faded out. Oh, mid-talk. Yeah.